The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Usually he's sitting right over here weighing in with thoughtful discourse and discussion, but this time we're putting him in the guest seat. Assemblyman Kevin Mullen talks about the local, regional, and statewide scene. The game is politics. The game is on. I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. I've been proud to call him my partner on the show, but today we're going to put him on the other side of the table. Assemblyman Kevin Mullen was elected to the office in 2012 and in 2016 was sworn in as Speaker Pro Tem, second highest ranking job in the Assembly. He served on the South San Francisco City Council from 2007 to 2012. The son of Assemblyman Kevin, uh, Gene Mullen, excuse me, <laughs> Kevin is married to Jessica Stanfield Mullen, and they recently welcomed the birth of two twin boys, Liam and London. Landon, excuse Landon. me. Welcome. Thank you. What Good a, to be here. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy being over there as I'm much as you. I'm more comfortable, actually, yeah. uh, as the co-host. Yeah, we'll, well see how this goes. tough. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with um, the topic that's, you know, that's always on everybody's mind for decades. As you know, if you took a poll in this county, education would often be number one, jobs would often be number one, Traffic and transportation trump everything now. That's right. Um, do you think we're making progress? I know there's RM3 uh, on the, the regional ballot on June 5th. Uh, I know you're intimately involved in working on a, a local sales tax measure. What kind of progress do you think we're making and we're going to make? And is it going to be fast enough to satisfy people? Yeah. Well, it's an excellent question, Mark, and it, it's great to be with you. Um, you talked about transportation and housing and how those two issues rank. What, what this really is about, I think, is all of the economic activity that's happening in San Mateo County. The number of jobs that are being created in our county, which is a good thing. We love jobs, we love economic activity, but we're dealing with the byproducts of all of that um, economic activity. So just in my home community in South San Francisco, there's a projection of 15,000 new biotechnology jobs. And South San Francisco is the birthplace of biotechnology. I chair the select committee on biotech. And uh, we love to see the economic transformation that's happened in the east of 101, you know, from the steel mill days and uh, a declining economy and the warehouse district turning into life sciences and leading the innovation economy. It's incredible, but we have this jobs housing imbalance I think the latest number was something like 18 to 1 for eight, every 18 jobs that are being created, uh, one housing unit, and we just can't keep pace with the number of jobs that are being created. So we're dealing with the byproducts of the economic activity. San Mateo County at large has the lowest unemployment rate in the state. I think we're going to learn it's the lowest unemployment rate in America. And with that, you've got the cost of living challenges, the difficulty in siting and building affordable housing and building density when uh, members of the community generally like the way uh, things are going now. They like the status quo, and you're challenging the status quo when you talk about density and development. So we're dealing with uh, all of those challenges. Not a day goes by in my job as an, as an assembly member representing this district that I don't hear about the affordable housing crisis. Yeah. And uh, I hear from it at home. My wife works for the county on the Home for All program and uh, dealing with the challenges of, of providing affordable homes for people in this super high cost area and a, a middle class that's being challenged with the cost structure. But I, I really do think some progress is being made more on the transportation front than the housing front. Although last year uh, we passed 15 new laws to deal with uh, this affordable housing challenge. The real progress, though, is being made on the transportation front, and I can uh, delineate all of that yeah, for let, you. Let's and, get, and in, you know a, let's get in, that in a second, but I want to go back to, you were talking about the number of jobs. You know, if you told people 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago during the recession that we'd have 2% unemployment, everybody would think that was miraculous. Right. Um, but now what you're seeing is, is a movement um, really beginning to express itself that these corporations, these companies, 
need to do more to provide housing for the people who work here. That's right. And the flip side of that, what you'll hear from the other side is, you'll drive jobs away if you do that. In other words, these employers will go somewhere else. So should we be, you know, should, should corporations be picking up a larger share of, of the impact that they're causing by creating all these jobs? Yes, but I think there's also a recognition among the corporate set that out of necessity, they have to be more of a player on the housing because they're having difficulty attracting and retaining employees. But it's not just a, a corporate challenge and those big companies do have resources and do need to be better partners in this. I could get into that question a little bit, but it's really a challenge for small business people too. If you go up and down uh, the main streets of our, our uh, suburbs here up and down the county, you'll see the help wanted signs of restaurants right. and, and smaller shops. So, um, you know, folks are, uh, many folks are living in the East Bay where land is a little bit cheaper and, and commuting. So it, there really is that, that interplay between the housing challenge and the transportation mobility challenge. But the big corporate uh, folks that are calling San Mateo County home, Facebook, for example, they are doing more in terms of providing some housing for their workers. Uh, there was a situation in South San Francisco, which is an interesting one, my hometown, where uh, folks in the biotech community were resisting uh, development of, of housing right. east of 101. And, um, you know, I bristled a little bit when I heard the, well, we support housing, we know we need to build housing, but, but not right here. And there were some issues there with uh, the 24-7 nature of, of their operations and so forth. And you do need to look at locations and, and what makes sense. But we have to be opening up uh, areas on the on the eastern side, east side of 101, to residential development, so these big companies can provide some housing uh, uh, for their workforce. So you're seeing gradual steps being made by the big employers, but this is really a, a challenge uh, that's been laid down to to our uh, cities to meet their uh, regional housing needs allocation, their RENA requirements, and um, how we can build uh, some density primarily on the transportation corridor. So we're electrifying Caltrain and there's some opportunity sites there. Um, I really think if done right, these kinds of developments can um, really bring overall property values up and create economic uh, opportunity in some of those downtowns and be a good thing uh, for the smaller employers and the small businesses up and down our county. But it really gets down to city by city and development by development. and and phasing these things in a way that people can adjust to. If you go too far, too fast, too dense, too high, people really do react to it because they like the status quo and they like the quality of life and, and feel that somehow that quality of life is being endangered. Um, so of, it's a real, it's a challenge, a political challenge. One of the more dramatic political issues uh, was the legislation by State Senator Scott Weiner that essentially would override local restrictions on density and height in transportation corridors and especially adjacent to transit centers. What was your view of that bill? Well, I reserve judgment on that. And, and I should, we should add, it died in committee. It uh, died in committee, it was a Senate bill and these things get um, pared back usually by the time they get over to our assembly uh, house. I appreciate Scott Weiner pushing this issue though because we're clearly not where we need to be in terms of our jobs housing imbalance. So, Scott and a number of folks are looking at uh, various levers that we could pull to either incentivize uh, local communities to approve these kinds of developments, or in some cases, um, and SB 827 was an example of that, start to shift the balance of power to the state away from local governments. Now, I'm a former council member and mayor, so uh, I certainly appreciate the local land use um, concern but we do need to be collectively doing more. I would like the state and the, and the cities to be working in a little bit more of a partnership as opposed to a combative role. The big thing from my standpoint is, when I was the mayor, we used redevelopment as an effective tool. There's a con controversial history with redevelopment and moving certain communities uh, uh, out and displacement and those kinds of things, but done right, redevelopment is a very effective economic development tool for localities. It was done away with 
in 2007 and 8 with the Great Recession. The governor was looking for every dollar that wasn't nailed down to uh, send to other taxing entities. I think you're going to see one way or the other some form of redevelopment come back because it was the single greatest source of funding for affordable housing and it's no longer in the toolbox for local government. So okay. more to be done on that. And, and more to come. Stick around. We'll be right back with Assemblyman Kevin Muller. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to The Game. I'm Mark Simon. Our guest is our normally our partner here, Ke Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. We were talking about housing, which obviously bleeds into almost everything. And, and you talked about, as a, as a former city council member, you don't want to lose local control. I've heard also that redevelopment may be making a comeback, especially once Jerry Brown leaves office, so he won't veto it. Um, but the fact is, one of the underlying premises of the legislation that Scott Wiener carried is local governments aren't doing it. There's just so many political crosswinds mm -hmm. that it makes it hard for them to do something. And, and so while I understand the, the concern about shifting more authority to the state, if the local government doesn't act to solve the problem, especially in concert with the regional needs, why shouldn't the state do more? Well, and that, that was certainly um, Scott's premise in carrying the bill. And if you look at the regional housing needs allocations, cities aren't um, keeping pace. Cities aren't doing enough, but as somebody who sat uh, on the dais uh, through a few controversies uh, at a city council hearing, it's tough to vote against your neighbors, mm -hmm. your friends. The people that come out to these hearings are motivated. Usually the folks who are motivated um, have a problem with what they're seeing or the direction of a development and so forth. So it takes a lot of courage to be on a, on a city council. You know, people, it, it's kind of interesting, um, the, the, the higher up you go uh, in the political, uh, on the political ladder, um, you become a little more removed from the immediacy of your decisions. When you're on a city council, you're making decisions that are directly impacting folks who you are in the Rotary Club with and in the swim club with and yeah. those kinds of things. So anyway, that, that's kind of just a political dynamic. And there's a tension there. I think um, you're going to see a variety of approaches to try to encourage and incentivize localities to build more. The economy will also shift. You know, we are riding uh, this economic recovery now into its, what are we in, like the seventh or eighth year? Um, and it's just so red hot that we continue to deal with uh, uh, all of the challenges from that econom economic activity. The real progress, and, and this is what I'm most encouraged about, frankly, is on the transportation front. I think we are uh, really, we're in the midst of a transportation revolution, a mobility revolution, how people get around, um, you know, autonomous vehicles and those kinds of things. But just in terms of what's happening in the transportation picture in our county, we're electrifying Caltrain. That is going to happen uh, by 2022. Yeah, they're putting the poles up now. For the it, virus. Is, it is underway, yeah. and that has really been a team effort uh, from the regional level, local, regional, state, and federal, uh, our federal representatives fighting for that federal piece of that funding. So that's going to happen. That's going to be transformative because we'll be able to you know, double the capacity uh, potentially on that critical commuter backbone. We passed SB1, the gas tax, which is controversial. There's a repeal of that on the November 2018 ballot. But I uh, was able to fight for money in the congested corridor program. Uh, that was sort of my effort during that whole SB1 conversation. Looks like uh, potentially here the county is going to get a 230 plus million dollars, the biggest allocation from that line item in SB1 to come to San Mateo County for the managed lane project, which would be the HOV3. 
um, uh, express which, lane. Yeah, express lane, which is also is known as toll lanes. It's also known as toll lane. I prefer, one, one. I prefer express. Yeah, but, a lot of people do, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the key there, though, and, and I, I want to make this point, is um, you know people sort of frame this as, oh, these are Lexus lanes. You pay to get your way out of traffic. The data actually shows that uh, people of all uh, socioeconomic stripes, if you will, use toll lanes in the toll lane network that is in other places in the Bay Area. The key is linking up the 19 auxil auxiliary lane segments. We're talking about Highway 380 down to Whipple in Redwood City. Linking up those segments to create another lane so you're not negatively impacting the traffic flow. I don't want there to be ease of flow in one lane and, and more congestion in the other lanes. The entire corridor needs to benefit from this project. So that's going to be my standard in, in um, saying that this is uh, a success, is that and, we're and, positively impacting the entire corridor. And it doesn't, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, there, the, the San Trans Board and the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors are putting together a, a sales tax measure for San Mateo County, also likely to be on the November ballot. <clears throat> that would fund things like San Trans Express buses. So that they would then use it. So in theory, that would help the, the lower income folks who might feel otherwise impacted. Absolutely. And, and all of these things need to be taken into um, account. You've got the state action with SB1. On the June ballot, you've got Regional Measure 3 to increase uh, tolls on toll payers. San Mateo County will benefit directly from the passage of RM3. I was at the table helping negotiate that. Regional Measures 1 and 2, the previous toll increases on the bridges in the Bay, really didn't do a heck of a lot for San Mateo County. There was a little bit of ferry money in there. But we have additional money for ferries at South City and potentially Redwood City opening up a ferry. Uh, to Redwood City, uh, money for the 10192 interchange, which I just drove through this morning, and that choke point there at 10192, and uh, Dumbarton corridor funds there, and then Caltrain uh, extension up to San Francisco, which will help our county. So there's real benefits and the managed lane project, but these things are all complementary: mm -hmm. the state level, the regional, and then the local. When we come in, uh, if the voters. Uh, uh, see the wisdom in passing the local uh, measure. All of these things will be working together, and we are going to be making a quantum leap on the mobility. Um, it's just, it's, a, it's kind of a complicated message to convey because you're talking about a list of projects, and you need to be able to convey it in a way that people understand how all of these things taken in total are going to improve their quality of life and improve mobility and how people get around and ease of, of movement yeah. in San Mateo County. We're going to take another break. Stick around, we'll be right back with Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. Assemblyman Kevin Mullins on the other side of the table for a change. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the political landscape Start with their governor's race. You've endorsed Gavin Newsom, and all the polling shows he's way ahead. Obviously, there'll be a runoff, but it's entirely possible because of there's so many Democrats that the person he runs off against in November might actually be a Republican. That is quite possible, and that scenario has been sort of out there. The top two changes the whole calculus, depends on how many people are running in the primary and who actually navigates that primary and gets through. There are a number of congressional seats, um, many in the southern part of the state, which are potential Democratic pickups, but you have um, so much energy on the Democratic side, which usually is a good thing, you know, getting your voters energized and your party energized. There's an anti-Trump fervor uh, among the left in particular. So you've got a bumper crop of candidates that are putting their name on the ballot, but that actually could have uh, the effect of, in some swing districts, having two Republicans running off against each other, and really Democrats forfeiting 
uh, a pickup opportunity. So the top two, you really have to be strategic. And I know the party's been talking to some of the lesser candidates to try to get them to yeah. uh, suspend their campaigns and so forth. So it really is a pretty wild scrum. The top two uh, is it, it's its own dynamic uh, entirely. But the governor's race, Gavin easily gets to the top two. The real question is what happens with that segment of undecided voters. And you know, for a state like California and with all the political activity happening, this governor's race has been very low key, mm -hmm. oddly low key, I would say. Um, you're just now seeing some of the ads coming for John Chung, uh, the state treasurer and Antonio Villarigos, the former mayor of LA. He's got some independent expenditure dollars that are coming in funding his campaign. But ballots drop on May 7th, yeah. so people will be voting. And in this county, I should just give a, a quick shout out. We are one of the uh, two counties uh, moving to an all vote by mail system where voters automatically get a ballot, postage paid, and instead of the traditional polling uh, uh, precinct level poll model, uh, you're going to have these high tech voting centers. So San Mateo County is leading the way on how we conduct the election. Yeah. And, uh, and that's been, gonna be an you've been a leading advocate. It's gonna be interesting. You've been a leading advocate for that. So at some point after the election, yeah. we ought to have you back on as a guest just to talk about how that went and if it all worked out. Yeah. <laughs> if it doesn't <laughs> Yeah, we'll blame somebody <laughs> else, yes. Um, one of the issues that, that uh, looks like it may be on the ballot in November, it's hard to know is Tim Draper's proposal to split the state into three different states, putting aside all the legal complications that that would create. Uh, the last poll I showed, saw shows 72% of the state uh, doesn't like this idea. Now, there's been no campaign, right. but um, do you see that going anywhere? No, uh, it's not going to happen. And when something starts off, when an initiative starts off that unpopular, it's really hard to turn it back the other way. I think. Uh, Draper is channeling some of the angst about um, sort of how California governs itself. And, you know, I, I fashion myself at least as a student of, of California government, having been a junkie for uh, so long following these kinds of things and the impact of Prop 13 and how our legislature is structured. Uh, there are some issues around uh, how many people each legislator represents, the senators, uh, over a million um, or almost a million uh, assembly members, almost half a million. Um, there are issues around the way state local finance works in California, which makes governing the state inherently challenging. You've got 40 million people, a nation state, and uh, I'm all for sort of looking at how we govern ourselves and figuring out what changes can be made. Top two, we talked about the byproducts of that, but that was uh, one of those things uh, put uh, before the voters to try to uh, improve our governance and, and, and improve compromise and, and try to uh, get more elected officials in the middle of the political spectrum, those kinds of things. So there have been efforts, uh, term limits reform and those kinds of things to make the state a little more governable. Yeah. But we do have a long way to go uh, on that front. But this, you know, splitting the state into the three is a pretty harebrained idea and is not going anywhere. And you know, we'd have to get some federal waivers and those kinds of things, yeah. and it's just not gonna happen. Let's talk a little bit about sort of the general environment, uh, because I'm sure you've noticed, as I have, um, a lot more sort of angry rhetoric than we're used to, even in this county, which has always been sort of a, a place where consensus tends to prevail. But you see, especially through social media, uh, a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, un, uh, unhesitating com uh, criticism, uh, challenging, uh, people arguing, uh, a real negativity about government, about the process. Does this concern you? Absolutely, it concerns me. Uh, I think um, some of the rhetoric we're seeing from the highest levels of our government, from the Oval Office and the incivility and the insults and so forth, um, I think it just undermines uh, the public's faith in our democratic, small d, democratic institutions. Um, so I don't have that uh, silver bullet on how we turn this all around. I just know that um, we need to figure out a way to restore the public's faith in government uh, as, as a way to improve people's lives. And we need to improve the discourse. Social media for all its um, uh, positives in terms of uh, communications and sort of opening up political discourse, 
I think in many ways it's added to the negativity, especially the anonymity on social media and you know, uh, next door and those kinds of things. A lot of negative comments uh, coming forth and people uh, becoming sort of tribal in their uh, politics and the algorithms on social media that reinforce your uh, pre-existing political philosophy, which actually hardens people's political philosophies as opposed to really opening up a dialogue and understanding. So there's all sorts of cross currents uh, on you know, technological innovation that we really haven't gotten our hands around. But it's more important now than ever that political leaders demonstrate and show an example of civility mm -hmm. and appreciation for those with other uh, opinions uh, than yours. And we have much work to do on that. I'd like to say in California, we have purposely gone uh, the route of bipartisan cooperation in the legislature and not vilifying our Republican colleagues. We have tried to create a civil uh, discussion and debate environment on the floor of the assembly, and I think that's important. Um, well, it's nice to stop on a positive note, Kevin. Yeah. Thank you for moving to the other side of the table. And thank you for being with us. Join us next time on The Game.